Hi and welcome to Frontline City Church's YouTube channel. We are a sterling based Assemblies of God church based right in the heart of Scotland with the goal of making disciples of Jesus who are spiritually robust, powerful and strong. We hope that you enjoyed today's message and if you would like to hear more from us, please feel free to check out our website which is linked in the description below. Enjoy. Let's have a look at the, the, the word together, shall we? Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, we'll start. Colossians three eighteen. Okay, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Okay, we'll leave it there. <laughs> husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for it displeases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, but as um, or as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For wrong, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Next chapter. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. And we'll just leave it there. Okay. As you can probably tell, we're going to touch some interesting subjects, <laughs> as you're probably aware. But the um, the first thing I want to say is this, that, that Paul was a... Uh, a master theologian, he he was able to put together so many doctrines and so much stuff and teach so well. And we find here, just, just quickly, he, he's taken the whole issue of the preeminence of Christ being above all, above all thrones, all dominions, all power, and he brings it down and says, but that same Christ is living within you. He is the hope of glory. You know, in another, chap, another book, he says that we have been predestined, we have been called, we have been... Um, um, uh, born again or you know regenerated and then he says that we've also been to we might be glorified justified that we might be glorified and so he's he's got this incredible uh, story that he's putting together and then he gets into the area of of the because of that your desires should be of above not below mm -hmm. speaking of spiritual things and the and the essential Spiritual nature of things is the essence of why God created it, how God created it, and what God created it for, both instead of looking at it in a central carnal sort of thing. So he presents all that through there. Then he says to put on this new man that God has created and then to, um, to let love and let thanksgiving and let this, thing, this stuff flow through you, okay? Then all of a sudden he swings into... Okay, I've given you theology now, and I, this isn't in there, but I like to put it in a little margin in my Bible that says theology that doesn't work is not is no good. Mm -hmm. In other words, we can have a lot of theology, but unless it works into practical, as I say, rubber meets the road, it's, it's absolutely useless. Mm -hmm. Okay, When I was a kid, I was about 14, 15, I don't know if they had it here in the UK, but there was a show on television, um, that's the 70s, that would have been, and it was called Kung Fu. And there was this guy, David Carradine, who was wandering around this, uh, the Western, old Western America, doing all this stuff. And he would have all these little flashbacks to when he was being taught um, ancient Chinese culture or whatever it was. And my dad, had, I forced my dad to watch it because in those days you only had one television and you, had to, and you had to watch the channel that was on. Remember that? You had to yeah. sit, in your, sit there and everyone had to watch what you were watching. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and they were gonna, and uh, he'd get there and, he, and the nickname this, this blind Chinese guy had for him was Grasshopper. Remember? Mm -hmm. And he would say, Grasshopper, when you can take this pebble from my hand, it's time for you to leave. You know, go on like this. And I remember once, He's there and he's and uh, 
and the Chinese, the guy who's teaching grasshopper, he says, grasshopper, when you don't understand, that is when you know. And I'm going, I'm going, oh, that's deep. That's really hard. You know, I, was, I was thinking, oh, this is really good stuff. And my father's going, you know, in, in his, I'll use his, I won't use the language he used. He said, what the, does that mean? And I said, oh, don't you know, Dad? I haven't got the clue. He's saying that. And I go, oh, it's deep, Dad, it's deep. He said, yeah, it's that deep, you can't find it, you know. But, and, and so there's, there's all these, we, sometimes we think the more mysterious it is. And you see, that's what Paul's writing to. He's talking about these whole bunch of people that think that if you get mysteries and you can know the deep mysteries, then you've, oh, oh you've got it there. But Paul then basically says, look, I've given you this great depth of understanding in, in, in theology. Now the rubber meets the road. How does it work in your marriage? How does it work in your family? How does it work in your, well, we're going to use the word workplace, but um, we'll find out in a minute that that's nothing like what he was referring to, but it's, it's anything we can equate to really in our society. And so he sort of brings this whole thing out. How does it work between your relationship with your children and so on like that? He said, this is where everything I've taught has to outwork. You know, I'm a mechanic by trade. That's my whole trade. And I understand all the different ways in which gearboxes work and internal combustion engines. And I know a little bit about electric stuff that, it, you know, there's got to be a flow of current from positive to negative and then And then it goes out, transfers into the axles and all that stuff. But it really doesn't. All that stuff is absolutely useless unless the rubber is on the road, mm -hmm. unless you've got wheels. You know, you can sit there and go rum, 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 rev up and everything, but until you engage and the rubber starts mm -hmm. to hit the, the road, you don't have any traction. And that's what Paul's virtually saying here. He says, you know, everything you do, do in the name of Jesus and be out working there and God will reward you. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives, okay? So I want to teach this in a... In a, in a what I would call a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's sort of like a holistic thing, if I could use that term. When we look at um, verses 18 and 19, we have to put them together, okay? A lot of people like to get that one verse, wives submit to your husbands, mm -hmm. right? And yes! Then they skip the next verse and then they go down to the next one. But the reality is that that really is a, what I would call a reciprocal verse. It reciprocates with, chapter, with verse um, 19. And it then goes on to say, husbands love your wives. Okay. And if I was to um, ad lib a little bit there, I'd say wives submit to your husband because husbands are loving their wives. Okay. It's not as though one causes the other like the submission causes the love. It's really the love causes the submission. Okay? So that's an interesting way of looking at it. The word submit um, there's, <coughs> has multitudes of usages, but I think that the best, the best one that I think is uh, in this text is that it's to set in array under. In other words, it means wives do not be independent of your husbands. It doesn't talk about slavery or servitude or being mastered and beaten down. It's talking about, hey, remember when God created us and if we go back to the beginning, and, and that's what Jesus did quite often when it came to the issue of divorce. He said, but that's not what it was like just because Moses allowed it and God allowed Moses to use and write a bill of divorcement. He said, but that's not what it was in the beginning. And he goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. And when it comes to these sort of subjects, when, he's, when Paul's writing, he's writing to a culture that was completely opposite to what we would understand. Maybe if we go to some of the more um, remote cultures of our society today, we might see similar things. But, I mean, the... The ownish, the, the woman was owned in most cultures by the man. And they often had many wives and they considered them 
if you go to New Guinea, I think it is, that um, you can buy a wife for so many pigs. You know, there's all these different things where the, the value, and if you actually translate in some of the um, island natives language, um, the man and the, then the most valuable thing next to the man is a pig because it's worth more than a wife. And so this is the sort of background culture in which Paul's writing into. You know, he's writing into a Roman culture. He's writing into heathen cultures where this whole thing. So when he says something like, wives submit to your husbands, that would have been slam, a slam into the cultural face of its day, you know. Um, even the Old Testament had this sort of situation within that. And so when he's saying that, he's not saying to them, keep them in servitude and keep them under. He's actually saying to them, let's get back to the beginning and understand here that it's a setting in array under. The wife should take notice of her husband and his, his desires. But then he goes into this next one where he says, husbands, love your wives. Now, that was not acceptable in most of the cultures. The concept of a husband being commissioned or commanded or even promoted or encouraged to love the wife was secondary in the whole, the whole matter. I'm sure there was cases where that happened but it was not your normal. And the word he uses there is the word agape, mm. which is a self-sacrificial love. Okay, here's the culture. Man's here, woman's there. Man owns the woman. She serves the woman. She does, uh, serves the man, whatever she wants to do. All of a sudden, Paul comes in and says, wives, I'm not telling you to dominate your husband, but I'm saying set in the ray under, to take consideration of your husband. But husbands... For this to happen, you need to love your wife. You need to love your wife the same way that God self-sacrificed himself through Christ for us. Wow. That would have been a real <clears throat> bomb in their society because it would have cut across everything culturally within the main. And that meant that the husband was not to put his own desires first or his own will or his own likes and dislikes, but to consider his wife in everything as well. So the submission, when you look at Ephesians, it says, submit yourselves one to another. Then it says, wives, submit yourself to your own husband. Okay? So the concept in which I think Paul's writing here is he's trying to capture the original intent of Genesis 1 and 2 when he gave them dominion and he gave them dominion mm. over it's my understanding and I, I this has helped me personally to understand the fall that when the serpent deceived eve okay and it actually says in bible and paul writes this too he says that the woman was deceived but adam was not deceived the big problem within the marital circumstance of that day of the husband and wife called their name Adam and all that stuff and gave them dominion and that they were to to do all the things that they were to do was that Eve was deceived she got tricked by the devil and said wow I can be like God but it says Adam wasn't and here's the point Adam should have stepped in mm -hmm. And said, Eve, you are being deceived here. We cannot do this. But he openly, knowingly, I don't think he fully understood the consequences, but he certainly knew that he shouldn't have done it. And then he ate as well. And we now have what we know as the fall. And so I think when Paul's writing here, he's not talking about, about a hierarchical structure. He's trying, trying to say, hey, this is supposed to be a partnership. Mm. This is supposed to be in looking to each other. The wife, she takes into account and sets an array under the, the husband in the sense of taking into account his leadership and his, 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 his will and so on. But husband, you need to be in submission to her because you want to find out what her needs are and what, what, what she wants. And in that, there will be this, this mutual reciprocation. And when the... And in marriage counselling over many, many years and different situations and circumstances, 
I've discovered that when the wife feels loved, when she feels like he has her best interests at hand, when he feels, when she feels like that he cares for her and that she um, is loved for who she is, not for what she does, there comes this sense of willing submission, if I can use that term. Okay, but when the wife does not feel loved, then there comes this: I've got to dominate or I've got to be dominated. And when you look at, <laughs> I didn't want to get into all this, but we're into it now. <laughs> When you look at Genesis 3 and you see the fall and what happened and God puts the curse on, on, on the serpent and on, upon the man and upon the woman. He says to the woman, he says, your desire shall be to your husband and he will rule over you. Okay. The, the way that, that it's written in English doesn't really capture what it means. In the Hebrew, in the idiom of it, it actually means that because of this action of you doing this and him not doing that and protecting that way, the curse that comes upon this thing of a man and woman relationships is that the man will try to dominate the woman, the woman will try to dominate the man, and there will be this constant pressure like this throughout human male-female relationships. And we see it today. We see it politically. We see it in, um, in within marriage. We see it within... Um, um, different social structures and so on like this, right? So when you read that, and people will often use that, that use that and say, well, no, that's the way that marriage should be, that the man should, that her desire should be, but he will rule over you and so on and take that as the marriage model. That's not the marriage model. That's the part of the results of sin, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. The marriage model goes back to Genesis. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Bible does talk about different roles for wives and men and so on, and we haven't got time to get into all of that. But what it does say to me is that the man as the head doesn't mean he's the dominant one. It actually means he is the life source to the wife. And when Adam, if he was supposed to be the head, then he should have been a life source to Eve. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He allowed this thing to happen and then we know the consequences of that that's in a very very concise nutshell without getting into every little detail of it but to love from the husband means to be agape self-sacrificing to take into the consideration of it that way i remember de dealing with situations in marriages over the years and so on and we we had a marriage seminar once in our church and and um, overall it was quite good. But the big problem was that the people who taught it had um, what I would call ideals. Mm -hmm. They had the ideal marriage, okay? Mm -hmm. And the ideal marriage, and then they painted what the ideal marriage was. And they had roles, Right? The man should be in charge of the money. The wife should be in charge of the home. And so, and there was all this stuff. And it was all wonderful and dandy until you realise that some blokes have got no idea how to handle money. And there's all these different things. And I began to realise that we cannot have um, cookie-cutter role models for marriage. Mm. We have principles, which I've touched on. There is areas of responsibility that each one needs to take and... Marriage isn't 50 50, it's 100 100. Right? But if you cookie cut it, whatever, you can wind up with some very delicate, dangerous situations. And I remember one couple, I think it was, decided, okay, well, you're going to take over the money. And so she just gave him all the money. Well, they, were in, they couldn't pay their bills, he couldn't handle it, he would spend it, and all that stuff. And we said, look, you've got to get this thing into a balance. Right? You know? And so on and so on. And, and, and so what I'm trying to say is that, that Paul's not trying to give us a set category. What he's trying to say is the principle is mutual submission, but the husband is commanded to love his wife and the wife to submit. Okay, Nowhere in the scriptures does it command the wife to love her husband. But the Bible does command the husband to love the wife. It does say 
that older women should teach the younger women how to love their husbands, but it's not set as a command. So we see here that men, and this is one of the things that makes me so angry and so sad, is when I see men use scriptures to try and justify and build themselves up as men and to dominate over women. That's not what Paul's writing here. I, I honestly believe he's trying to get the, the them principle. He called their name Adam. He, he gave them dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and so on. Then when the fall came, we know that he, there is an aspect of adjustment, but ideally it's to try and get the them principle back in place. Okay, I'll leave it there. But there is so much more that we could um, go into, and I've really only just touched it. But I see if when you get into the area of the head, the, the man is the head of the wife, it actually is talking about a life source to her. Same way as a head waters of a river, supply water to the river, so the man is to the... And we get things in Ephesians like the, 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 the husband is to wash the wife with the water of the word. You know, it means the husband should be teaching and feeding the wife and, and, and nurturing her in the things of, of the spirit and the word of God. And of course, in a culture where women were not educated, that would definitely be the case, mm. where women were not allowed to mm. sit under the scriptures. The man would have to do it. So you've got to take these things within their cultural mm. settings and see the principle he's trying to get is mm. that both should be washed in the word. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And you know, there's a lot of dispute over, over a lot of that stuff. But in essence, we, we're not supposed to use the scriptures to win an argument. And we're not supposed to use the scriptures to dominate one another. We're not supposed to use the scriptures to create division. We're supposed to use the scriptures to live it, mm. to live it out and to make our marriages work and to make our... And he goes on then to talk about fathers and children and children. And he brings this whole thing into a balance again. And again, we're doing this, if we look at the scriptures again, um, let me go back there. He, you, you, you can't just take the one without the other. When he says, children obey your parents and everything, this is pleasing to the Lord. Yeah, well, that's a proper statement. But he couples that with, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Mm. You see what I'm saying there? Mm. That by the, husband, by the father not provoking or the mother not provoking or the parents not provoking their children, then they would become discouraged. Now, of course, he's not saying don't tell them to clean up their room. He's, not, he's, he's talking about this. Within, within a culture where, where the children did not have an opinion, the children's ideas and ideals and passions and visions were not necessarily taken into account. You were there to do the will of the father, their father. He's trying to drop a hint here again, cross-culturally, clashing culture, saying, hey, hey, maybe it's a good idea to find out what the child's really good at <laughs> and what the child's passions are a little bit. Don't provoke. But also we can see this in, in other ways. As our children get older, especially if they've been in church and whatever, it's far better for us to talk to God about our children than to talk to our children about God. When they're young, we talk to children about God. We teach them about God. We train them in the ways of the Lord, all those things. But there comes a point when they know, but then they decide to do their own thing. That's when you stop telling them about God and you start telling God about your kids. <laughs> and talk to you God about them. <laughs> okay? We've found that to be very successful because if you start... Told you can be becoming to provoke them, but children, of course, and um, it means that they should obey their parents. It's not Paul is not suggesting that they disobey this and you let them get away with everything. Okay, then it gets into this other one, which is not really. It's very difficult, this one, because um, bond servants are not really employees. <laughs> Masters were not really employers. And to try and equate this into 21st century it doesn't quite equate, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, you've got to remember that a bond servant or a slave in Roman days, 
okay? And he's not writing, he's writing to a Roman uh, colony, a place that was under Roman rule. And so bond servants were well, virtually non-people. They had no rights whatsoever. Mm. You could falsely accuse them, you could beat them, you could kill them, and there'd be no questions asked. It was like this is a no rights person, a person who had no rights. Mm. Okay? As far as Roman law was concerned. Now, to be totally honest, there were lots of benevolent masters mm. who looked after their bond servants and their servants very, very well. Mm. In fact, um, when I was doing a in-depth study with the Bible College on the Luke and Acts, um, there is a suggestion, and it's, you know these are guys that know all this stuff. I don't know at all, but they suggested that Luke possibly was a, originally a bond servant of um, Theopolis, because he writes, "Dear Theopolis, this is the treaty that I've seen and how I've seen it, and so on." Like that, and writing it has been commissioned to do it, and the and the conjecture is that he more than likely could have been the son of a servant of Theopolis, right? But you see, a benevolent, a benevolent master would see the value in these mm. guys and would educate them, and they would be trained as doctors or lawyers or whatever, mm. and they would have a very nice lifestyle within the confines of being in this. Slavery. So we look at look at the word slavery, as soon as we see it, we think of, you know, slave trades, we think of mm. roots, we think of, you know, all the all the, you know, twelve years of slave and all that stuff. And that's very true and that's not I'm not disputing that that happened. But at the same time there was cases where people were benevolent masters and really gave these people a way to elevate. And the conjecture was that Luke may have been one of those and he was actually a trained doctor, well educated, and everything, and completely supported of by his master. But um, we don't know for sure. It's Bible doesn't say, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so we can edit that. No, <laughs> but it's just it's just it's just an illustration of of the society in which they had no law, no right. So when Paul's writing here, saying a bond servants obey in everything of your earthly masters, not in eye service, not just people's service, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. He writes to them first and says, guys, listen, even though the Roman doesn't give you rights, even though the, your, bond, your master may not care about you, maybe not even see anything you do, but the Lord sees. And in everything... Work as unto the Lord. Work under your master as unto the Lord. Now, in those days, there was probably no way he could buy his freedom. But, you know, this was a sort of a life situation that they were in. Um, we try to equate that to employees. And the principle of if you're employed, you should serve your employer. Not just the man pleaser, not just the people pleaser, not just mm. as a nice service, but sincerely properly and do the job that you've been asked to do mm. and do it as unto the lord right but in fact the bond servant had a lot a lot lot harder situation than what a, a modern day employee does mm. in fact a lot of employers would actually say that the, our laws favor the employees more than it does the employer but but in those days it was completely opposite it was you know so we can only draw, we can't go like for like, we can just draw principles here. And I remember when I was working, my one of my early days as a Christian, in a, as a job, oh, I tell you, if I had understood this back then, I would have saved myself a lot of frustration and heartache. I worked, I did the job and I did it well, I did it honestly, I did it full of integrity. In fact, I kept on climbing climbing up the ranks within the, the, the job I was at. I, I could have ended up being a manager, I could have ended up being a general manager of the organisation at the time, if I, if that were, but my attitude was wrong. My attitude was, oh, I want to serve the Lord. I want to get out there and preach. I want to be a minister. I want to, I want to, I want to do that. This is just, oh, why don't I do it? 
and I used to be an automatic transmission and transmission specialist and someone like that. And I used to live with a mate of mine. We used to share a flat together. And uh, he used to say to me, he said, every morning, mate, you'd get up and you'd say, oh, I hate transmissions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you come home from work, you go, oh, I hate transmissions <laughs> and, uh, and whatever. And I, although I worked, I don't believe I did it as a man pleaser, I don't believe I did it just as nice service. I did it for the boss and did a good job and was honest and integral and so on. I missed out on such a blessing because I didn't see it as doing as under the Lord. Mm -hmm. I did it begrudgingly. I did it because I did. If I could wind the clock back, I could have had a great time, but instead I frustrated myself. Here's the stupid part about it. I got to the place where I tried to force God's hand, so I resigned. I resigned. And they went, what are you resigning for? And oh, I just, I'm going to... I had no job to go to. I, I just, oh, I guess God's got to open the doors and everything. Guess what door he opened up again? I became a casual employee to the same place. <laughs> and I went back there and they, and, they, and they brought me in day after day to do differentials and stuff like that. And, I hear differentials and that. And then all of a, then all of a sudden, uh, the, the doors began to open and all that stuff. But uh, it didn't, let me put it this way. My attitude didn't defer God's purpose for my life, but I certainly made it hard for myself because I mm. didn't do it. And when he's writing to them here, he's saying something somewhat similar, really, because he's saying to them, listen, uh, you're a bond servant. Well, that's what you are. So serve it, but change your attitude and say, I'm going to do this unto the Lord, mm. unto the Lord. But he said, whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. I wish I'd read that. I wish I'd known that. I probably did read it, but took no notice yes. of it. But look, if I'd known that, you see, what, what he's trying to say here is that whatever you're involved in, if you do it as unto the Lord, you will receive an inheritance. And I didn't realise this, but like I was receiving an inheritance physically because I was going up and getting better positions in there, but I missed the inheritance of the blessing of God that I could have had as well. Because mm -hmm. you're saying, oh, if you do it the right way, God will, not only will you get blessed by doing the job properly and they get advancement there or pay or wages or whatever, but the Lord will bless you. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, man, <laughs> if only I'd known but I should have known, but I didn't. I do now. But that's what he's trying to say. But as I said, it's such a narrow example in comparison to what they were living as a bond servant. You understand? Mm -hmm. We try to bring the comparable, but it's not quite the same like that <coughs> in that way. The two more things. The dangerous part or the hardest part I think I had when I was working for one employee was the, 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 the difficulty that this guy was a crook. <laughs> he would want me to do the wrong thing. He'd want me to put parts into the machine that didn't need. He'd want me to charge. I remember once um, a man had to get a new, got quoted for a new transmission at the time it was two hundred dollars, I suppose, and uh, so I got down to take the transmission out. He said, "Oh no, no, don't take the transmission out. Just take that little rubber thing that's been sucked flat and change it and put a new one on, and just take the pan off, change the oil, and and then get the kerosene gun and squirt all up around it so that it's going to paint the bottom all black." And I said, well, why would we do that when we're going to put it in, do the transmission up? He said, no, no, all that's wrong with it is that little little rubber thing. A, a, a dollar, a pound to fix it. And I was in this place of, what do I do here? Mm. Uh, I, he's going to rip this guy off $200. And I said, well, and here's the even harder part. It was my uncle's car. <laughs> <laughs> That was difficult, I tell you. And so you get to the place where you, you need the wisdom of Solomon sometimes 
in some of these things when you're working for a um, unjust master. But you still work as under the Lord, so you, you, you find your way through these things. It's not easy to do. And um, so I, 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 I do understand that these things are not always um, as simple as we'd like them to be. Mm -hmm. no way. But it's the way it goes. And the, when it says to do the work, it means to do it diligently in that way. Then he finishes off with, he now goes to the masters. Now you've got to remember the master isn't, we try to compare them with an employee, and I'm sorry, an employer. But we have employers that are under extreme amount of rules nowadays and so on and so on. So we can't do like for like here. Mm. But the principle is that as an employer, you should treat your employees fairly, justly. I think the word that's that's used there, uh, let me see if I wrote it down here, is um, is that you would use the treat them with equity and impartiality in other words you treat them as human beings you treat them which would have been not the case on the roman slavery but you treat them as human you treat them fairly you treat them uh, with equity and impartiality and you treat them as you would want to be treated yourself because he says remember you have a master who's above you and he will treat you the same as you treat your master you treat your servants so in a very little nutshell, having touched quite controversial issues here, basically what he's saying is that everything that the book of Colossians has taught us up to this point has to be outworked in everyday life. Mm. And that's where our Christianity, the rubber meets the road. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. If you did, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up, maybe share it with a friend. And if you want to know more about our church, then please feel free to check out our Instagram or our website in the description below. We hope you have a blessed week. God bless.